And we have our folks on Zoom as well. Okay, it's gotten quiet, so that means everybody's ready. Well, this is the man of the hour. This is Mark Gerber. We spent some time together, and I really didn't know uh, what to call this, but then after spending a little bit of time, I realized he really is a character. Although he makes character, he, he's, he's quite a character of his own. Okay. So we're going to, uh, this is a tribute to Mort and his work. Um, one thing that you'll find is he, he's done a lot of work for a long time. And some of the work that he's done years ago has come back around full circle. Uh, and is is very timely, and he's even reissued some of his work because it is so timely. So I'm going to narrate, uh, but then I'm going to be very quiet as Mort explains um, some of his cartoons that we're going to show you. There we go. Okay. So uh, kind of a, a sketch of what we're going to do. We're going to uh, talk about Mort's background, and we have some comments from his peers, and I'm going to summarize some of the awards since he's uh, received some notable awards, notable awards over the course of his career. Uh, a little quick epithet on his family life. And then uh, Mart's going to share what's motivated him as a cartoonist. And then I kind of set up these categories. Uh, Mart has a, a book, uh, which is a collection of all of his cartoons. And I perused the book, and Mart uh, encouraged me to pick the cartoon, some of the cartoons that I liked. And Marilyn also, Marilyn Salzman also, so I put them into categories, and one category is moments in everyone's life that we can all relate to, uh, New York, music, women's rights, sports, social commentary and politics, and then we're going to talk about how cartooning has changed over time, um, so more to give us a retrospective on that, and we're going to look back. And we will have time for questions, uh, both those who are attending in person and those who are on Zoom. Uh, as we go along, if you see a particular cartoon or something and want to ask a question, just let me know and, and we'll field the question over the course of the presentation. Okay. Hmm. Okay. So I'll stay here. Okay. Um, Mort broke. Mort broke into print with irreverent, irreverent drawings, in the Realist publication in the early '60s. His cartoons have since appeared in all major magazines, including the New Yorker. Playboy, and the Saturday Evening Post. There we go. Mort's cartoons covered scenes both historic and overlooked, from the fiery women's marches of the 60s in the infamous 68 Democratic National Conventions to live pubs of London and Greek belly dance clubs of New York. <laughs> I'm not very I'm not very light on my toes. 
Uh, above all, Mark Gerberg is a keen political and a social observer whose curiosity, compassion, and razor-sharp wit has informed his work for over five decades. There, there's another screen that I can read. For 50 plus years, wherever the action, Mort's been front and center, a, a gimlet-eyed observer and artful insta chronicler of our times, as fluent outside the box as in our pages, crying within it. And that's from Emma Allen, the cartoon editor of The New Yorker. Uh, this is my favorite from George Booth, a cartoonist with The New Yorker. Gerberg is an outstanding and prolific talent. I just hope he someday gets himself straightened out. <laughs> Knows his work. He's one of the great, great, great ones. Yes, right. <laughs> Mort Gerberg was ahead of his time, not only with his cartoons uh, in my magazine, which is The Realist by Paul Krasner, uh, but his goatee was also ahead of its time. Unfortunately, we don't have that anymore. Okay, some of uh, Mort's awards, and I do say some, on some of these. Uh, in 2004, Mort was awarded the City College of New York's prestigious Townsend Harris Medal for notable achievement. He was a City College of New York Communications Hall of Fame honoree for 2010, and not too long ago, Mort was voted as Best Magazine Cartoonist of 2007 and 8 by the National Cartoonist Society and received five NCS nominations in other years for his Best Magazine, magazine Cartoonist and one for Best Advertising Illustration. A whole series of things. I used to do a lot of stuff for the New Yorker magazine as well. Not only the cartoons, but because of my prior experience, which was, <clears throat> excuse me, nine to five, I worked for Cosmopolitan magazine as an advertising sales promotion manager and also for Ziff Davis publication. I was in charge of 16 magazines. So I knew how to sell stuff uh, with words and pictures. So I guess that's what it was. Would, would Beaver Creek count? Beaver Creek was one of my best, yeah, thank you. Ilya was the, uh, was one of the recipients of the large yes. It was the, and, and Matt, yes. But we don't want to talk about the same time. The years were different then. Uh, Beaver Creek was a big sponsor of the New Yorker magazine. At, in the New Yorker, they advertised. And uh, they chose uh, four or five cartoonists to come to Beaver Creek and labor, labor by staying at the foot of the hill and draw people when they came down off the slopes. And I had to do that, you know, for about uh, 20 minutes a day. <laughs> Meanwhile, in, in return, they gave me uh, a week of room and board uh, for myself and for Judith and for Lilia and for Matt and uh, it went on. It was one of the best freebies I ever had. So that was uh, terrific. Oh, it's because it goes without saying, I, I was always a, a dear a lover of, uh, of skiing. So I was, uh, and I did a lot of skiing cartoons, but that's whatever. Anyway, we're, we're getting ahead of it. I, I don't want to. But somebody had to do it, right? I can't hear you. I'm sorry. But someone had to do it. Yes, tough work. Okay. Uh, Mort has mentioned members of his family. Yes, from Jaina, actually. It's a whole thing. She's the, the and, and my wife, yes. Yeah. They're worth it. Well, there's the entourage. Uh, Mort's wife, Judith, daughter, Lilia, son-in-law, Matt, and grandkids, Jaina and Max. Okay, uh, Mort has explained to me, and now he's going to share with you, what motivates a cartoonist. Oh, I 
finally get a chance to talk now. <laughs> That's good. And you're going to be doing actually yes, talking no, for it's, the rest of it. It's, uh, I think what, it, on top of the introduction that I normally use, it's it, re reminded of the fact that, that I think the underlying thing at all that a cartoonist has that most creative and, and writing people and everything else, they look around and they see things outside. And it's, it's certainly important to come out, of, get ideas out of your own head. But I think people who are observant and looking at things and are probably beginning with the DNA naturally slanted towards responding to things. Uh, and that's the way it was. Judith and I was doing actually a presentation up in Cape Cod at Nantucket. Judith and I uh, went up there. I was invited to speak at a synagogue. So, of course, uh, being there, I was eating a lot of seafood. We went out, we had some uh, lobsters and all that good stuff up there. And it occurred to me, as I was thinking about what I was going to say, it occurred to me that a cartoonist is very much like an oyster. And it's really very, very simple. It's an oyster... Oysters in the ocean, swims around, a lot of stuff, lots of jets, and a lot of schmutz, always in the water. And every now and then, a piece of schmutz gets underneath the shell of the, court of the oyster. And what does an oyster do? It responds by producing a pearl. So a cartoonist walks around with an irritating skin, or looking at things, things bother this, at least attracts the attention of something inside him. And the cartoonist responds in a mystical way, which is only known by very, very smart people, <laughs> how it's done. And it comes out to be a pearl of wisdom. Now, that's basically really the whole thing of how it's done. Uh, I've written a book about that too, but that's beside the point. It's hard to explain. But basically, it's looking around and seeing things, and you never know where they come up. I was looking at the board, the typeface on the board of these memorial things. It's a wonderful typeface. I'd never seen it before. I asked somebody here, and they said, no, I don't know what it is. I don't know where that'll come from, but that's what the response is. Anyway. Now we're into your most talked about. Well, there's a few. Okay. What's the first the caption? The caption um, in this uh, very Greek hallway is I've always been partial to high ceilings. All right. Well, this 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 is actually the the unusual thing about this cartoon, first of all, it's in, from the New Yorker from 1965. And the unusual thing about it was is that it was printed as a full page in magazine. Hardly, that probably never happened before. It was also not the first cartoon that I had actually sold, but it was the second, and, uh, but it appeared at that time. Uh, but that's the point. And once again, I can think about <clears throat> myself looking through the pages of uh, the, the magazine, the New York Times uh, as well, and seeing a photograph of I think it was St. Patrick's Cathedral or something else like that. And being a lifelong New Yorker, uh, my own reaction was to that, oh, it's got high ceilings like that. It's on high ceilings. And I thought, well, that's a funny juxtaposition of taking this. And there's a long story about it, but it's in the other book that I wrote about how I actually created that. But it's been reprinted a large number of times, and it's been a favorite, you know, for people to talk about for that reason. My first appearance <clears throat> in the New Yorker magazine, my first, you know, there, starting out with a full-page cartoon. From then on, of course, it all went downhill. That was <laughs> no problem with that. All right, what's the next one? This was another one that was really very, very specific on this. Okay, uh, I'm going to read the caption. Oh, who's coming in? And there is Michael Andre. He's doing the big, you know, David. Uh, and the Pope says, "Imbecile!" I said, "Fresh coat, not fresh coats." <laughs> and that was another thing. That was a, a photograph in the New York Times. You can see where I took the photograph. And that's all the background. I certainly wasn't going to redraw all of those pictures. And I just added the bottom part of the guy on the stripe doing um, stuff. So that was another thing of recognizing something and turning it around. Uh, why don't you do it there? What's the next one, Jay? 
Okay, yes. I'll read, let me read yes. the caption. Uh, let me, let, let me, let me no. do this because this is a. Uh, right. People on Zoom can't. I went, I went to. I'm going to move this forward a sec so that you can see it. I'd like to see it. Don't start. You, you need a, a, a rocket scientist brain to be able to do that. You, you need the acoustic and vibration you sensor. Say, there you got it. No, yeah. So now you can stand there and aim towards it, or you can sit and it should. Um, I won't touch a thing. Leave it now. It should be. Nice. This one. Yes, I know. That's what <laughs> we walked on the path last year. I learned all about exploding whatever. Um, this is very notable because, uh, as it's, uh, Jay already pointed out, one of the earliest, the first magazines I really got started at was a, a magazine, a counterculture uh, magazine called The Realist, and uh, totally iconoclastic. And that's, uh, I began my career practically do, like doing things like that. And as it turns out, one of the big issues of the day uh, that day, that day, uh, meaning 1960 or so, when I was just coming back from Mexico, was abortion and this whole thing, abortion issue, a whole issue. And I did this cartoon that nobody, of course, is going to print, but it was in The Realist, which is Paul was just doing this. As you can see, the, the, the caption is, well, it's the woman in the shoe, as you can see, and she's on the phone. Dr. Burnhill, uh, you know me, but I've been told you could perform a, a certain oper operation. I mean, in those days, it was really clandestine and people really had to sneak around and it was a very, very, very tough, tough issue to be dealt with. 1960, and what year is this? I just put up a cartoon today. There's a, on social media, but that's another story. It's me. Um, reacting and that's where they talk about me being in social political whatever a big mouth whatever okay the one on the left can you hear let, let me explain what what they're seeing and then you can comment on it okay since this is a little hard to read the one on the left is actually uh, a photographer with his tour guide on a safari, and you've got a real collection of animals, and, he, and the quote is, I take it then that we are not the first safari ever to visit this area. This is something, again, comes out, Judith and I went on a safari. Uh, some years ago, I had an assignment to do with pages, but that's another story. We never went any place without me trying to get an assignment. I mean, if I could get, you know, $100 or $200 to do six pages, that was fine. I wasn't making much money, but I could deduct $2,000 that it cost me to go on a trip. That was fine. We went on a safari and I thought, oh my God, the eye <clears throat> going out in Africa, all of these animals and things. And so we drove to a site where all the lions were going to be and the lions were lying around like this, you know, like so. It was something that not a big deal. So they had sign, seen not only ours, our Jeep, but every other Jeep in the whole thing. It was boring to them. They couldn't have cared less. I'm looking for, I that was there. And so I thought about that. And I thought, these guys are lying around. What, what is this? And I thought, obviously, they've been discovered before. They've been photographed before. And I thought about that a little bit more. And voila, it came out to be this cartoon, making fun of it. And then uh, the cartoon on the right, you've got uh, a little caterpillar looking up to the fully blossomed butterfly. And the caption is, the thing is, you really have to really want to change. I'm just looking at the data that that's 2014. So that's a relatively, really, really new one. I say really, I thought it was yesterday. I don't know, it's almost 20 years ago already, but not 20. I was bad at math, I still am. <laughs> anyway, um, this is very, very, very uh, well uh, received. Got a lot of reprints, requests for that. Um, 
I think probably uh, Judith probably had a lot to do with that. She has a lot of these uh, uh, wonderful suggestions about career and culture and psychology and stuff like that. Uh, Judith, by the way, is one of the the world's foremost career counselors, by the way. We have to sit there too, you know, all of that. Anyway, a uh, lot of reprints for that too. And uh, uh, actually I had fun trying to draw the butterfly and everything else, but that's another matter, getting to draw drawings. <clears throat> okay. Oh, okay, um, just some narrative first. The one on the left is, two seals, um, and one is saying, of course, what I'd really like to do is to direct. This is another one. This is a very early one from the New Yorker in 1969. Uh, very, very popular. And again, uh, it's a reflection of my own, first of all, my own way of doing things. You notice the way I, I want to keep in control of everything, which is why working nine to five didn't pan out for me, as it were. Um, anyway, it got to be a funny thing of using the, um, the metaphor or the phrases that Hollywood uh, will always use to drive back down here. And as it turned out, a couple of years ago, <clears throat> the New Yorker ran a feature in the magazine, which was a year-end feature, and uh, they were going to uh, ask famous people, celebrities, humorists, what their favorite cartoon was. So it was a three or four page uh, feature that was really terrific. And the first cartoon that was chosen for this feature was mine. And it was the most favorite cartoonist uh, cartoon of uh, Steve Martin. Am I speaking? Yeah, Steve Martin, right. I couldn't remember. And I thought, oh my God, Steve Martin. It's turned out, funny little things there. It was amazing, you know, and I, uh, I wrote to Steve. Uh, I had met him before at the New Yorker uh, get-togethers or events, and uh, he wrote back on the car. I sent him a copy of the, uh, uh, and he, he wrote me back a note saying, is this really you? Uh, I gotta get a DNA test of the things. <laughs> People have great senses of themselves. He's, he's a wonderful guy, but he doesn't draw, so it doesn't. Yeah, not then. The cartoon, um, well, it just says out of line, but this one does require Mort's explanation. Can you explain the one on the right? Please explain yes. the one on the right. This is, yeah, no, this, this again, I'm trying to. 1960-something, it's in here, uh, what the date of it is. Uh, this is one of these cartoons, first, again, in the, in the interest of social justice, political justice, or injustice. This is very early, and I sold this, and it was published in the Saturday Evening Post. Um, Paul Krasner, again, the editor of The Realist, to whom I had submitted it originally, said this is terrific for us. Of course, it's, it's again, the early, early comments about uh, race uh, uh, problems. And uh, he said, when you sell cartoons like this, or I print them in the magazine here, you're preaching to the choir. Everybody knows this already. Be more important if you could try to sell it you know, someplace else. I brought it to the Saturday Evening Post, and lo and behold, they took it and they saw it. And again, it's been very, very, very uh, widely received. Uh, anyway, it's one of the, the ultimate of a great cartoon or a good cartoon is one that doesn't have any caption, where the whole picture or the whole story is told in the drawing, the way it's done, how it's set up. I'm very proud of this also. Thank you. Okay, uh, when I got- Let me explain, let me explain the re reportage. Most people, many people don't know really what reportage is because they never really seen it or heard it practiced. Uh, once I started to get better known or I was selling all of the magazines at that point, uh, I realized that it's not, it's cartooning is more than one box. And I always like to draw, I always like to sketch. 
And so it was a combination of things, of doing quick on the spot sketches and also scribbling impressions of what was going on. And I would go out and I say, I would cover this. And so this is at the infamous, as it were, Chicago Democratic Convention in 1968. Uh, and I simply went to the Saturday Review, Norman Cousins was the editor, and I said, Norman, I'll give you six pages. And I went to Dude, and I said, I'll give you six pages, whatever. Uh, the quick story is, I went to Chicago, I got press credentials uh, by simply showing up or asking, spent the three or four days there, filled two sketchbooks, uh, it was amazing, it was just an amazing thing. So it's a combination of on-the-spot live drawing coupled with on-the-spot live scribbling, cut together, pasted, put to some magazines. This is one of the pages from the uh, from the magazine. It's also in, in in the book. A couple of these pages. Um, what's the next one? Is there another one? Um, so another passion of mine is the Knicks. Uh, you guys don't know about the Knicks, but right? they were a great basketball team in their day. And I was a crazy fan. So this is a two-page spread. I went to a friend, actually, the editor, Sport Magazine. I'll give you four pages about the Knicks playing. And so you can see in the heat of the game, I don't know which, which of the pages that they use or not. Again, sketching and my reports of overhearing things. You get a lot of intensity of the, of the things that were going on right, right then. So reportage covered <clears throat> all my favorite subjects. I'm dealing with things that I am interested in or I am reacting to. What's the next one? Oh, this is the biggest one. This is, I went to London um, after, <clears throat> after the Beatles had turned the world upside down with their forming, they had created Swinging London. And uh, I realized that from both my friends and other relatives that uh, all of London wasn't swinging, that most of it was not even aware of the or Beatles. And so I went over there. I was with a friend who was a photographer from Playboy. Uh, I think I was there for about two weeks, sketching, drawing, going out to all the place, and uh, meeting all kinds of people. And again, produced about six pages in uh, uh, London. Uh, a lot of these uh, spreads are put together with um, pieces. They're not all the scenes themselves, but I would put the, the scenes together from individual uh, places that I sketched. Uh, and this writing was a little bit more uh, intense than simply scribbling. But, you know. Okay. This is what. Oh, okay. okay, well, I was going to read the one on the left. Uh, you can see the woman on the scale, and it apparently costs a, one cent to get your weight. And the caption is, you doctors don't miss a trick, do you? I want to give Jay credit. In this case, he's picking out things. What was the title of this? Everyday life? Yeah. My everyday life, it was thing. I mean, when do you have to go to? Okay, that speaks for itself, you know, pretty much so. Uh, <laughs> not that I not that I went to doctors that often, but I could see it for every little thing. Sometimes, you know, when they write the your prescription on the pad, you know, and they uh, give you the prescription, and uh, it's hard to read, so they do it again, and then they charge you for the autograph that they get. No, no, not don't do it. Don't do it. Okay. And the next one, the next one is my definitely my own uh, very personal favorite. I'm going to read the caption on that. Yeah, and this one, um, if you're a New Yorker, you'll especially relate to this one. But it says, one last, re you know, he's on his deathbed, uh, with, surrounded by friends and family. One last request, move my car to the 11.30 a.m. to 1 p.m., Monday through Thursday, side of the street for tomorrow. Um, people who are not born and bred New Yorkers uh, don't appreciate this as much as they really should. But it was my life, and very often, to try to keep 
a car on the street on West 82nd Street off Central Park West because it had to be parked and reparked twice a day. I would probably say I probably wrote and created 15 or 20,000 cartoons while sitting in my car. It was the most important you know, thing to do, uh, to have a good parking space. And also the side of the street controlled the whole, the whole thing. So this was very, very autobiographic to, to, uh, as it, to it. Originally, I actually, I thought, you know, when we were making out wills when we were in the city, uh, and they talk about where you're gonna, you know, go away, you'll be retirement place, or you'll be in a retirement home. Or, or I said, we're not gonna move any place. I'm gonna get buried in my car. You know, that's just moving on that I would move it. All right. That's not true. I made that up. <laughs> you have a car oh, this this is another one that's just does require any introduction. There's no caption, but again, the buses in New York, uh, you know, there's a lot of buses and they're all different numbers and things. And it was always, for me, it was the wrong bus that was in. And it was just a natural thing then, once again, to actually imagine that it said M15, it would say it's the wrong bus. Well, at least you know that it was the wrong bus. It would be helpful for that. All right. This is a New Yorker also. Oh, now this is Judah's favorite. Judah's favorite, we have to get it back. Actually, this was published in, uh, in Playboy magazine. So they not, didn't do everything else, but you can see the caption. The caption is, what, are you crazy? We've got tickets for the producers for tomorrow night. I don't know, does everybody remember the producers? They were the most, it was even more important, Jane won't believe this, it was more popular than Hamilton. <laughs> yes, 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 my dear, yes. More, years and years people wanted to get this. And so, um, did we have, did we get, we went to see it, or we did, oh, I remember Mel Brooks wanted the, Mel Brooks the, the, the caption. He's not a very generous guy. Uh, the cartoon ran in the mag in Playboy, and I get a, a, a note from, from Mort. I love this cartoon. Uh, uh, can we? Can I have it? Can we do it? Normally, I mean, there's another story about people. People sometimes, or very often, they like my drawings. They pay. They buy them. I mean, they're original art. They hang them on walls. They pay good money for these paintings. Not necessarily my George Booth. They pay thousands of dollars for a George Booth. Anyway, the con came in, talked to Mel Brooks. He says, I'll tell you what, uh, you give me the drawing, I'll give you two tickets to the producers. <laughs> I said, Mel, I mean, the, the ticket was costing maybe $80, you know, $85. Huh? Then. then, yeah, yeah, then. But I mean, I'm not trying to, you know, push anything on you. But I've sold drawings for, you know, five, six hundred dollars or thousand for a couple, whatever. I said, no, it's not equitable. He says, no. He says, that's it. I'm gonna say, no, 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 never mind. So forget the whole thing. I mean, anyway, the point was that it was a very, very, very tough ticket to get, and this was my ultimate way of, of saying, oh, are you crazy? I mean, I just think I said, are you crazy? Very New Yorkish. Oh. <laughs> um, I, the one on the left, pay special attention to uh, the person directing traffic. Okay, I think I finally seen one performance too many of the Nutcracker. So the standard thing, I mean, uh, we took Lilia for dancing lessons uh, early in the uh, in, her, in her career, and the idea was that maybe we we're gonna get her to dance in the Nutcracker. All the families in New York would have their kids going to ballet lessons to try to get into the Nutcracker. And we watched the Nutcracker. Jana, how many Nutcrackers have we seen together already? And you many, many. So it was a normal kind of thing, and at some, some Christmas time, I might have felt I've seen too many nutcrackers already. And this was my extension of imagining that he would be directing traffic in the middle of Manhattan. So there it is. Uh, this one will live on forever. Um, he's, the waiter's taking his order. 
And he's saying, uh, the guest is saying, what I'd like is different presidential candidates, but I guess I'll just have the shrimp and garlic sauce. That had to do with my uh, rather dismal opinion of whoever was running. Th these were all in the New Yorker, and this is about the limit that they were going to go for political commentary, because that was, you had to do with kind of silly, and, uh, and there it was. But certainly there was my, you know, in intention on there. Uh, also, Chinese food is very big in New York, so it was a very normal kind of thing to be doing that. Okay. This goes back, this goes back to, uh, to Paul Krasner, which is uh, very early. This is 1964, so this is in the Realist magazine, again, with the other you know, abortion things. And there was very, very difficult to try to find an apartment. And it was always a thing that you you try to stop the, uh, the the doorman or finding out whatever you could of where there was going to be a, a good apartment. So uh, uh, in this case, that was the situation. So the doorman is telling the gentleman with his umbrella, are you still interested in old man Burnhill's penthouse, sir? I got word he's going to die this week. Well, it's, it has happened uh, in cases like that. Uh, the four panel uh, on the bus, uh, the next one, is also uh, a New Yorker cartoon. And again, uh, stemming right from my oyster-like uh, 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 reactions to the things like buses that are slow. This bus talked back to the lady, as you can see. Uh, she is all riding on the bus, and then uh, she gets up and she uh, rings the bell. She says, uh, uh, stop requested, and then she sits down because the bus says, uh, request denied. <laughs> so that was a typical New York uh, tough bus. What was the other one? Okay. One of my favorite uh, other uh, things is uh, subjects that I explore uh, is uh, music. Uh, I'm also very grateful for having my son-in-law, uh, Matthew, in my life, who's a great musicologist. And uh, one of these days is going to play a, a great uh, series of tunes for me on one of his 19 guitars, and, uh, or 20, or whatever. It's really great. Um, so I was attracted, I play the piano, I sing in a choir, I do all this kind of stuff. And in 19, this would have been 63, um, I, uh, there was a big thing coming up of folk music. And we had things like Peter Paul, people like Peter Paul and Mary. And uh, there was a big festival called the Newport Folk Festival in 1963, 64. Reportage again, I could go up there, draw these people and this is about, uh, I would say, a 20 or 40 second sketch of Bob Dylan, just like that, because he was walking around. And who was else? Who else did we have on there? Oh, I, I think it's in a different uh, section in, in here, but I've got Peter Paul and Mary and uh, all of that. But it was part of the the same sort of reportage, of just getting it quickly and getting the impression. I think even well, what's the next? One? I was doing a lot of uh, folk music cartoons for Hootenanny magazine. It was a big, big deal in the Greenwich Village and everybody was around there. So uh, can you read the caption on that first one on the left? Yes, the father is uh, adamantly telling his young son, I said, no, you cannot go to college and be a doctor. Now shut up and practice your guitar. Everybody was uh, playing and singing. It was a whole thing, and that, that's truly the thing. And uh, the other one, again, uh, um, the, uh, can you read that? It, it looks like, well, I'm going to say a couple of hillbillies. And there's a gentleman coming up from his car on the right, if you notice it. Um, and the quote is, think up another one, Jeremiah. Here comes Alan Lomax again. So please explain who Alan Lomax is. Lomax was the big collector of all those things, and everybody was collecting, you know, great uh, songs from the old days. What's What's next? <clears throat> uh, 
the, the point is it was a, a music thing. Oh, this is one of my real favorites uh, from, the, uh, from the New Yorker magazine. As you can see, it's a 17th century old sitting around there and the woman is pumping her hat out the window. Can Wolfgang come out and play? <laughs> she wanted, she wanted to know. Uh, I grew up in the streets of Brooklyn, and uh, one of the great thrills I had having grown up as this little peewee kid was when somebody would ring the bell downstairs because they needed somebody else to play punch ball or strict stick ball. Hey, Mr. Gerberg, could Morty come down and play? So it became translated into this when I was doing my uh, thing. Yes, what do we got now? Women's rights. <laughs> Women's rights. So I have to tell you, uh, and the whole situation of before with, with the abortion and stuff, I met Judith and I met because of women's rights. I had had an, a, a fire in my apartment in 1967. Um, yeah, 68. In February, there was a garbage strike. Uh, there was a whole mess in New York City. My apartment blew up, it was on fire. My photographer friend, Jerry Ulsman said, idiot, don't stay here in the freezing cold in the winter time. I got an assignment here in St. Thomas come with me, we'll go down, you'll be rested, we'll take care of your apartment. He gets me a ticket, I go down, I'm flying with him and his wife, and needed the model, wind up in St. Thomas in the middle of the morning, early, early, early morning, and we're getting off and we're there. Unbeknownst to me, but as of course we constructed later, Judith had been returning from a company, a friend of hers who having, had a certain operation. She was in a company. And Judith was sitting on the bench on the beach in St. Thomas in the morning. And when we came in and we sat together at tables, but I was numb. I didn't know what was going on. I had an apartment that was in flames. And Judith was like this, I was like this. We hardly spoke, except that she was offering me bread at the table. <laughs> And she liked the way I was dancing. And when we both decided to had individually on our own, decided to get earlier flights back to New York on Sunday, she was standing next to me and behind me online at the, to say how that. And when we sat next to each other on a plane, I wonder how that happened. She arranged that. <laughs> <laughs> and we got, we got in and on the plane, she said, by the way, I happen to have another apartment in the city. You know, maybe uh, you'd like to use that. And as they say, 53, two years later, whatever, they were still here. Anyway, <laughs> it all began because the women's rights were there. Judith was in the forefront of it. We marched a million miles. I did a bunch of books, I did television, I did all kinds of stuff. I met all of the early uh, women's rights people and largely because of, uh, of her. So uh, it's opening up your ears. And uh, unfortunately, uh, as Letty and well, Gloria Steiner and everything, we have to do it all over again. So it's unfortunate. But anyway, that's where this began because this is so important. What else do we have on here? Uh, Oh, she's, uh, she's got the sign there. That was the first thing. Yeah. I loved it. What was it? Well, the caption, the gentleman is saying to her, um, why can't you just nag me the way you used to? Yeah, that was the first. Love this one. There were other things on this uh, section also, wasn't it? Jay? Well, well uh, on the, the board next? that she's pointing to. Oh, no, what's sorry. the next? Sorry. Okay, next slide. Oh yeah, so here's... Um, here, here we are uh, marching, uh, and the again unfortunate thing is, I think I put this up again last week, didn't I? Oh, I sent it to Letty, uh, yeah, or Judith sent it to Letty. Uh, a woman's work is never done. Well, uh, that's the way it, it sort of is. The one in the upper right hand corner is a uh, cell from a video, uh, an animation that I did uh, before I know how to do animations, uh, where I 
uh, it was a five or six minute animation that ran on CBS. Uh, and basically it was a basic story of uh, Santa Claus's wife, who was getting a little annoyed that she was never getting credit for all of the things that she had done. And Santa Claus was getting credit for everything, but she was the one who was wrapping the presents and she chopped the things and did all that. But it was, but I love to- So I, the captions, uh, this is Mrs. Claus, uh, with Santa Claus uh, kind of sitting down. Uh, and Santa says, you don't know it, but Christmas is a very tough gig. And Mrs. Claus responds, I don't know Christmas is a tough gig. I work twice as hard as you, but you don't know it, and neither does anybody else. Well, the, the personal thing about me is that, see, I'm also a ham, uh, as you may have discovered already anyway, but I, I love to do voices and things like that. And so uh, I voiced the Santa Claus uh, who spoke with a heavy, very heavy uh, Jewish accent. <laughs> and, and so did Mrs. Claus. Well, I had somebody. Um, anyway, that was uh, lots of fun, and I did several of those. It was just a question, again, once again, of, of examples of the media. And again, this, this book is a, sort of a compilation of a lot of these things. And the whole point was to show that I was, although I, I sold all the magazines and all of the cartoons, there's a lot of other things that I had done. So it's the next. Oh, I forgot about this. This is a comic strip <laughs> I did about Koki, and Koki <clears throat> was before her time. She uh, was a working wife, mother, uh, and tried to start a career of her own. This was uh, 19... Uh, 79, 1979, when we were just sort of getting started. Uh, it ran, it was syndicated by the Chicago News Tribune Syndicate, ran for several years, but uh, like most of the things, uh, uh, did not uh, earn enough money for me to have a retire uh, at home in Switzerland or someplace like that. Anyway. Oh, uh, back to sports. Um, this was from, uh, uh, I mean, we really love to do the source. This is from a, an assignment that I got from Life magazine, which nobody ever had sold before. Uh, and it had to do with the Mets, the New York Mets baseball team, not the Rockies, but uh, they had that day. And uh, <clears throat> uh, Judith and I went down to Atlanta. Uh, Judith actually managed to sit in the press box which was unheard of in those days because uh, women were not allowed in the press box. But I said, I, I have to go out and teach this photographer what to shoot because he didn't, he had been assigned uh, off by Life magazine. He had just had an assignment from Icebreaker up in Canada and he had never been to a baseball game in his life. So I was also like shooting that was fun. Um, obviously there's a, a, a comparison there, I was making a, a comparison between uh, the, the great losers in the world, which uh, to sneak a little politics in there, you see was Nixon and uh, Charlie Brown. So uh, they, they were together. The caption is rivaling the Statue of Liberty as a symbol of hope to the downtrodden everywhere. The Mets hold a special place in the hearts of all, all losers, great and small. And as a, as a nod to Judith and my father-in-law in the upper uh, box uh, seats in the balcony there in the upper stands, uh, there's a little sign. It says, Murray loves the Mets. So it's, it's there. Uh, there's another backstory about putting names of people uh, whom I love in uh, my uh, cartoons. And we'll, we'll maybe save that for, uh, I see it's getting a little tight. Move on. Um, this is a cartoon, uh, the captionless cartoon is a parody of a, a very classic uh, Charles Adams cartoon. <clears throat> Again, uh, got my interest because of skiing. The Adams cartoon originally showed this tracks belonging to one skier. 
and that was the Charles Adams cartoon. And I just did the other explanation for that. Uh, I think just quickly to refer to the, the cartoon on the right, which is from City College, uh, which will date to uh, 19, between 1948 or 1952, which is telling you that I'm 170 years old already. So it has to keep going on. Uh, but again, all of the stuff that I'm doing is basically things that are my own interests in one way or another. Closely on the right. Social commentary and politics. This is social commentary. Let me just run through these very quickly. This, unfortunately, uh, ran uh, two years ago in the New York, or three years ago. Uh, 89, 19, <laughs> 1989, we were, I was already giving the shies out at the uh, National uh, uh, Rifle Association. Can you read that? Ah, what a beautiful morning to be alive, well, and a member of the National Rifle Association. Okay, how about that for being on crazy, prescient, but terrible. All right, go on. Next. Um, that was a... Um, the one on the left was a, a cartoon that I drew when I had, that was in preparation of not being on, uh, I, I did the coverage of the Nixon inauguration in the 72 elections. I was on the Today Show with Barbara Walters, and while she interviewed me, I did this drawing. And it was always a question of who was going to call, you know, the, the race before anybody else. <clears throat> um, I think that the uh, the one on the right is uh, some leftover uh, reportage that had to do with the U.S. Open, uh, the tennis. Again, something else which I love a lot. The fact that in, in uh, those days, uh, it was very rare to see uh, black people, uh, not only on the court, that they didn't exist except for Arthur Ashe, uh, and, or in the stands. And so this was very, very special in this way. Next. Um, well, the first one was my, uh, uh, with the emergence of, of Donald Trump uh, in 19, in 2017, I started to do a lot more. I was doing stuff for the New Yorker uh, dailies and also for the social media. So where a lot of the stuff now appears uh, because I don't bother with the magazines anymore. And the one on the right is probably one of the all time popular cartoons. Again, uh, early, early uh, arrival, I think of Trump. This is from uh, 98. <laughs> 98, yeah. Um, as they were complaining, you know, th those weren't lies. That was spin. Spin was the big heavy word there. So that was it. All right. I think that's the uh, squeezing a lot of this stuff in. Max, you had a question before. What did you want to ask? No? He said the L's do the work. The L's do the work. Or Santa Claus. The elves. Uh -huh. Oh, right, right, right. Well, that was a different cartoon. <laughs> Max can do cartoons too. All right. Uh, you had some specific things, or you? Well, we just wanted to hear from you um, what it was like then and how different it is now if somebody is doing cartooning. How, how has the profession? of a cartoonist changed over time? It's changed mostly because it's, it's disappeared. That, that's probably the biggest change. Um, in my sense, uh, actually, I, I think the easiest way to describe it is when I began, uh, when I was drawing cartoons for Lincoln, this is in the 18 uh, something, <laughs> no, a little further than that. Um, there were something like 60 magazines I could walk around and sell cartoons to. Uh, a lot of them were uh, paid maybe $5, but uh, I could sell a lot of cartoons. I could get into print and I could see what the work looked like. It's a lot different when it's on your drawing board between in there. 
So it was very important also to be able to get a certain rhythm and establish, to be able to see one thing or another. And it was this great hierarchy. I started out with what they called the men's magazines, the girly magazines, the jokes, the specific things like, you know, library and daily, you know, really big things, the law, whatever. And gradually go up to Saturday Review, Look Magazine, Saturday Evening Post, you know, Harper's, uh, Playboy, I finally sold Playboy. Uh, I finally get up to the New Yorker, and I finally did that. And over the years, until today, the only magazine that's left for any relative importance is uh, the New Yorker. And uh, that in itself uh, is uh, also problematic because it's a different, um, there are different cliches. There's a different world, totally different generations. Uh, I make references to things and people, uh, uh, Lomax, you didn't know, people don't know these things today. People of my generation will think my things are funny uh, and relevant and to whoever, but the newer generation uh, doesn't. And conversely, I look at the stuff that's in the magazine, singular now, uh, and I don't understand it. So I think from that standpoint on, um, it's very different primarily because there's so few markers. You go to a, a, an airport railroad station, what used to be called a newsstand, and there's nothing in there. There's like, I don't know, they're like want ads for refrigerators or something. I don't know. Yes? I think it's all changed. Right. Um, and I think it's also changed on what's It's changed in terms of how much, what you can write about and how many different topics you yes, can take on. Yes, but at the same time, it's a double-edged sword in that sense, Max, because there is an opportunity for people to write about, more people to write about things that they want with, with, without editing, but at the same time, that gives people who have diverse opinions that opportunity also to, you know, write their side of it, uh, and there's a little confusion about what the editors will think is going to be best, which side are they going to choose. So I think it's a little unsettled. Uh, in other words, I have an opinion about what uh, the editors in the New Yorker are choosing to do. Uh, in their quest for allowing other voices, uh, disparaged voices, no longer the, if you will, you know, the old men who are white, uh, are not given as much sway now as the LBGT, whatever is, et cetera. Uh, on the other hand, uh, whether or not there's the same level of uh, talent involved is something else. I think it's complicated. And also people are doing different markets. Cartoonists are also doing graphic novels. They're doing a lot of different things. I was going to get to that too. That's why as I began in the, in the book that I wrote called my cartooning book, um, and why I myself chose not to stay within this box. As you can see, I was doing reportage, I was doing movies, I was doing whatever. Now it's imperative. People who are cartoonists in the way I was beginning in the cartooning uh, world uh, can't make a living on it. I mean, I, 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 I was doing very well when I started out uh, selling $5 cartoons to magazines, uh, I didn't have to make more than uh, $4,000 a year. I mean, it was different. I had an apartment in Greenwich Village that was $52 a week. Five, two, five, two. A now, a month, a month, yeah. And now uh, I just saw the latest one, the average apartment rental in the city is close to $6,000 a month. 6,000 different times. Yes. Okay. Uh, looking back, uh, just briefly, Shouldn't any any regrets? Any regrets? Anything you would want to do over differently? 
differently? Anything you'd want to change? I think if I had wanted to, I, I, I would have, uh, uh, the difficult, as I had sort of indicated uh, before, I had, uh, uh, I, I didn't really start seriously becoming a cartoonist until I was 31, 31 years old. Um, which for, you know, a lot, that's, that's pretty advanced to start a career. But I had already had these other, other careers. And what I did was to say, listen, I can't do that career anymore. I, I, I've got to do something different. So I've said this before, I didn't choose to be a cartoonist. Eventually, cartooning chose me. And, and it all goes back to the DNA. It really, it really does. Uh, I've taught uh, hundreds, maybe thousands of uh, students who have come to read a book. And uh, there was a cartoonist, a wonderful cartoonist in those olden days when I was beginning, named Richard Richter. He was a great, great artist, wonderful cartoonist, terrific draftsman, a painter, and he was the authority. He was the person I would like to go to. He was the man on the mountain. And I was doing a lot of interviews for the cartoony book that I wrote, uh, asking many people their advices and their interests. I'm with the Misha. Misha, you are the person, you're the last word in this. When people come to you, they show you their work, uh, and, and they say to you, you know, what do you think of this, Misha? Is this, is this good? Should should I be a cartoonist? Do you think I should be a cartoonist? And Misha looked at me and said, well, if they have to ask, they shouldn't be. And that's where it was. So I don't know if I could have changed it if I would. Uh, uh, we'll open up for questions, but before we do that, I want to thank Marilyn Salzman, uh, because if it weren't for Marilyn, uh, she planted the seed and, and suggested this topic. Uh, I knew Lilia, but I didn't know her parents, and I had no idea how accomplished their careers were. So Marilyn suggested the topic, and I thank her for that. Questions? I didn't hear anything. Thank Marilyn for suggesting the program. Marilyn Saltzman suggested the program. Oh, thank you very much, Marilyn. <laughs> Any questions either here or I want on Zoom? Yes. So, I'll, I'll, I'll repeat it. I'll repeat it. Which, which, which comes first, the drawing or the caption? The impulse. I mean, that's that's the honest answer. Uh, usually, it's a thought. Um, what I had yesterday, for example, in the morning, uh, when the uh, the full weight. Uh, of the Supreme Court decision was resonating and still rattling around in my head and giving me a large <clears throat> stomach upset. One of my thoughts was, what do I do with, with this? One of the most challenging things, and I have the greatest respect for my good friends who are the editorial cartoonists, who really are able to come up with the most incredible write-on ideas. So it's the ideas that are there. Uh, and I, I wasn't able to get anything. And then I saw something that somebody had done um, with uh, uh, justice. You know, I did justice holding the scales, blind justice. And that was, and I said, oh, th there it is. There's something there. And I didn't get what it was until a couple of hours later. And then I was up till what, about two o'clock this morning, uh, getting the drawing done, and then also having my time with uh, uh, getting the technology to work. 
but I finally got it on and I posted it. So it's on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. I put it up before we came over. Other questions? Yeah. Do you see the world as a cartoon? Do I see the world as a cartoon? That's a great question. Uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> But again, it's the way it's a, a proposed. It really is. And I go back to DNA. I can't help myself. As you have already noticed, uh, first of all, uh, I don't hear very well. My hearing is really, really depreciated. And as you can see by this mask, by this, uh, by the way, I'm not going to be doing too much for this eye patch. Uh, Jay suggested that I explain this. Uh, I'm not going to be doing uh, too many more cartoons or writing. I don't know what. Uh, I've got a new career I'm embarked on. I think Jana may have suggested this before. Um, I'm going to be a pirate. <laughs> so I, I'm going to still need to be a pirate. But in the meantime, the actual explanation was I was running for the bus. I'm always running for the bus. So this is in 2018, I think. I was running for the bus, and uh, I always beat the bus. I was always like to do that. But in this case, I ran, and I turned around to see where the bus was, and I fell on the sidewalk on 23rd Street and really smashed up the left side of my face. And uh, right now, I, I have double vision. It's like this. So if I didn't wear the patch after all of the other stuff, I'd probably be fine. But my wonderful uh, daughter and son-in-law and grandchildren took me skiing anyway. We went to uh, we went to Breckenridge and we went to uh, uh, yeah. Vail the first time. My two years here, so it's still you know it's still there. Anyway, um, uh, the point is that it is. A, the disabilities or the abilities are the things that, that change. It. And I remember one very specific thing. Is, uh, um, I was on a subway, and there was these two corporate men holding briefcases, and they were very, very corporate. They were white shirts and ties and briefcases, and they were walking I think it was in Grand Central Station. They were walking purposely, of course, you know, to wherever they were. I mean, one was saying to the one said to the other, "My, what a, a beautiful day! It really makes you glad you're alive." But I didn't hear that, and I didn't see that. It was almost an instant thing. I saw these two guys walking out in the suburbs where a lot of people had been moving, where all the houses were the same, they were all out there. And one guy was saying to the other one, my, what a beautiful day. It almost makes you wish you were alive. <laughs> I had nothing to do with that. It was all the DNA. But thank you, that's, I think, what it is. Where in Brooklyn did you grow up? I'm sorry. Where in Brooklyn did you grow up? Well, I grew up in, a, in Brooklyn in many different neighborhoods. Uh, this was in the, uh, in, the, in the Depression, and so my parents moved around in different places because they offered rent incentives different for a couple of months here and there. But basically, it was uh, Gelston Avenue. It was in um, Fort Hamilton, Flatbush, Bensonhurst. Bensonhurst, Flatbush, you know, like uh, around there. And then ultimately, uh, we moved to uh, Manhattan. We had a, Judith and I had this great apartment on in the village, but then we, when Lilia was born, the apartment, while gorgeous, was too small for her. Uh, my piano was in the bedroom kind of thing. I have a big, big grand piano. And so we had to move, but that's beside the point. Yes, Max? Well, uh, they were probably a little bit older than I. What was it like growing up with people who lived through the Great Depression? Well, in point of fact, I was born in 1931, so I think that's sort of part of it. Um, uh, I don't think I knew that there was such a thing as a depression. We had enough to eat. 
Um, I mean, I knew what things cost, I knew things that I didn't have, but we were surrounded I, by family, um, a mother, a father, and a sister, um, father's parents, mother's parents. It was very good, I think, with family, and we stayed together, and uh, we looked back on it, we got it through fine. So it wasn't, it wasn't an issue, Max. It wasn't like it was, it wasn't like it was something that was difficult to get through. We sang a lot of songs. My mother was great on playing the piano. And uh, it's one of the things that Judith and I, you know, fasten ourselves to. We can still sing all these great, great songs from those days. And I know the lyrics to all of them. And I'll sit down and play, did you ever see a dream walking? Everybody know that one? No. Yeah. Did you ever see a dream walking? Well, I did. I mean, you know, come on. So those are the things that held us through. Any, anything on Zoom? Um, okay. Yes. What were the tools of your trade? The tools of your trade. What were the tools of your trade? What were, what were the tools of your trade? Tools. Tools. Uh, I guess it depends on what you mean, like drawing with. And how have they changed? The well, I guess it was depending on what I was working on as well. Sometimes when I was doing the cartoons that were prepared for the New Yorker, and that was a kind of a, and, and also for the Saturday uh, Evening Post, they had prescribed or so-called prescribed tools which is a dip pen, like a number two point you put in. They had a whole thing of doing blue pencils and tracing over it and drawing lines like that. These are the cartoons that went to the magazines. Uh, I found that much too restrictive for me. I'm, I'm, I'm too like a loosey goosey guy. And uh, I got a fountain pen and I knew that quickly. And that worked for me particularly well uh, for doing the reportage stuff. Although sometimes I had to be, you know, a little smart. I once had this great assignment to do the Stow Cup uh, up in Vermont. They have these college races, uh, and I went to Stow, Vermont, and I got this job to job my love to go down and and record this. And I'm there on the base on the slope like this, and uh, dug in, hunched down, and I'm starting to do my drawings and uh, the pen the ink started to freeze up in the pen and I had to use something else. But even then it was something to change because the snow was coming down and was making the drawings run a little bit. But for different things, I did uh, this reportage uh, because it was fast and I could get a nice thick or thin line uh, that was enhanced by the rapidity and the energy of that. Uh, lately, I've just been using whatever I can find, pencils or uh, those uh, markers, uh, I can't remember the names of them, anything, it didn't matter, you know. It's not the tools, it's, it's who's using the tools. I mean, it was, no. I mean, Rembrandt used ice cream sticks. You didn't know that? He sharpened them. I made that up. <laughs> Any other Any I think that's it then. Well, thank you very, very much. Very informative. Thank you, thank you, thank you for listening to this. Uh, uh, it's it's nice to finally, you know, tell some stories that I have never had a chance to tell before. <laughs> thank you for coming out in this weather, as it were. Okay. Thank you so much, Mo. Oh, thank you for watching, Barbara, if you're there. And for those wow. in Zoom, thanks so much for participating and watching. I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah. It was thanking those on Zoom. Thank you, Mort.